All right, real quick, we're good. Let's do it. Good morning, Rotarians. Yes, little future Rotarians. <laughs> Please join me in pledging allegiance to our country's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can't you? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day and all the many blessings that you've given all of us. We thank you for Rotary and ask that you continue to help us do good works in the world. We thank you for this great country of ours and, and help us to heal all of the ills that we have at the present time. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. A couple of housekeeping things before we get in our presentation, our Walking for Dreams brochure is done. Uh, thanks to uh, Walter at Sinorama and the uh, Walking for Dreams uh, support staff. This went from uh, an email Sunday night to having it in the hand last night. So, great turn around. I'm going to, uh, I'm passing them out this morning. And those of you who aren't here, I'm going to be mailing copies to you. So, like I said, you know, several times we've not had a fundraiser in like 18 months. So we need to make this one work for us if we're going to be viable in Matt's, in Matt's term. <laughs> Mine, mine's pretty well done, but, you know, I want Matt to have some resources to work with. There we go. Yeah. Matt's term. So we got a lot of a lot of nice projects I think we're going to get involved in the next year or so. Uh, chatting with... Uh, uh, Tracy Williams over at Bossy yesterday, and the Interact Club is doing a penny rule. And I didn't know what a penny rule was. Basically, they're just collecting pennies from other from their other classmates and all. Each class is competing against each other, and uh, the bragging rights and maybe some prizes. But everything that they collect is going to run a McDonald's house. So I thought that's a great thing. So, and I. Uh, I suggest to her that you know, you know, we might you know kick in something too, like ten dollars to every class or something, just to boost the amount. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and uh, the oh, a volunteering out the COVID clinic, uh, that's that's bit that's great, very rewarding experience. I wear my rotary shirt and I just got all kinds of uh, attention. <laughs> <laughs> Passed out some cards, <laughs> recruiting people, so. But it's I, I you know if you have the time I strongly encourage you to volunteer. It's easy to do. So uh, Chris uh, Rutledge from Banterra, he's did it one time and I did it once and I'm going to uh, do it this Friday. So it's 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 real easy and it's like I said it's very rewarding. They were so happy to have us. I talked to one of the one of their chief officers. I don't know what he was. But when he came in, everybody, everybody paid attention to him. So. <laughs> and there was a couple that had driven all the way from Ferdinand to get their shots the day I were. Wow. If they waited to get it at the New Boys County, kind of, they would have been the 8th of May before they got it. This was last Monday, the 8th of March. So two months quicker here. And it's due to the volunteers. They only have four or five paid employees out there. So everything else is staffed by volunteers. So. And I believe that's all I've got right now. So, Matt, you have anything? Um, not at the present moment, no. Okay. You want to introduce just keep our sending, sending uh, program speaker ideas to us. Yep. Please have do. Any, and I'll introduce our speaker today. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Vaughn. Lisa Vaughn is heading the Feed Evansville Initiative. And this is this a technically a program of the Junior League Feed Evansville? I mean, th Feed Evansville was sort of created a, a need based upon work. So it's separate from Junior League, but based upon work the Junior League, Evansville Junior League was doing uh, as one of their priorities several years ago um, uh, of combating food insecurity and, and addressing issues of food insecurity. And so that activity, some programs of the Junior League um, kind of set Lisa up to kind of create the Feed Evansville initiative. And she'll talk a lot about that today 
Um, and so we're excited to have her. She's a past president of Junior League. And for many of you who've been members of the Evansville Morning Rotary Club, we've had a good relationship with Junior League when we sponsor the bike, um, a bike event several years ago. And so it's exciting to hear um, this connection. And so I introduce Lisa Vaughn with Feed Evansville. Thank you. Mabel. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Really excited to talk to you about the initiatives that uh, not only Feed Evansville has been working on, but Junior League. And, and you are correct, they kind of molded together. So how Feed Evansville got started was about a year ago, actually, let's see, it's the 10th, so maybe the 11th of March. Um, one year ago today, um, Alex Burton at the time, who was the city council president, who's a city council member, called me to see if Junior League was still going to do their free lunch program during spring break. So to give you a little backdrop, Junior League uh, took on food insecurity as their uh, citywide issue a couple of years ago. And we've been studying food insecurity and the effects it has on children and different things. And we started a free lunch program um, July of 2019. <laughs> and we were going through the promise zone and passing out free lunches to children when school wasn't in session because we found out that that was a severe situation. Um, and we not only were going to pass them out um, during spring break in 2020 with the government shutdown, we increased. We normally do about 200 lunches in every neighborhood we go in. We decided to do 2,000. So uh, Alex and I started talking and I started going, well, but you know, this is going to happen too. And you know, this is going to happen and this is going to happen because of the shutdown. I knew the ripple effects. And by the time him and I got off the phone, he was bringing his friends to the table. I was bringing mine. We had a call the Friday after we talked, which was like two days later. And by the end of that call, I had started to meet Evansville with Alex. <laughs> so that's kind of how it started. And I think Alex and I thought, well, by the end of April, we'll be done. We'll all be back to normal and things will be fine. Well, here we are having a cake next week because on March 16th, we started serving food and we haven't stopped. The only day that Pete Evansville has not done food or some type of programming was on Christmas Day so for the entire 2020. So I'm excited to go on vacation when everything opens back up because I uh, would like a day or two to sleep. So, <laughs> so um, to give you a little thing of what Feed Evansville has been doing, we started off at CK really um, with Junior League helping promote the free lunch program and getting it huge because going from 200 lunches to 2000 was a huge undertaking. So we also started doing uh, grab and go lunches at the CK Newsom Center to anyone who could come up and get them. We also helped uh, with Junior League, actually Junior League and Feed Evansville kind of to your point, work hand in hand. And I think it's because they know somebody. So uh, <laughs> we, we helped uh, the Evansville school system staff the cafeterias during the first couple weeks of the shutdown so they could continue to feed the kids as well. Then within two weeks, we were able to get, Feed Evansville was able to get permission from the governor to take SNAP through different SNAP programs that are already existing in Evansville. And we started a pop-up grocery store that was feeding over 200 families a week, taking groceries, and be able to take SNAP and stuff online. A little tidbit, no place in the Evansville area or the tri-state area will allow SNAP participants to have delivery systems. Only Amazon and Walmart, you're like, we have a Walmart. Our particular Walmarts don't engage in that program. So <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, so we had a lot of people that didn't know how to get to the grocery store. What were they going to do? A lot of elderly people that were scared to go out at the time when we all weren't, we were very unsure. And then Feed Evansville started handing out, doing pantry boxes, emergency food assistance. And then by June, we were able to um, connect with the USDA government uh, program, Farm to Families. And since then, we've been handing out 3,000 to 7,000 food boxes weekly to families in the tri-state area. So just yesterday, I did over 2,000 boxes um, in one day. So we're really excited wow. about that. <laughs> I'm excited about it, but sad all at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I want to let you know some things that junior leagues are working on. So if you want to advance. So for those who might not know, uh, the Junior League of Evansville is a women's organization that empowers women to be civic leaders through an effective development program 
through volunteerism. So there's a lot of misconception that junior league is just about volunteering or it's kind of a social thing for women. And it's really not. We're here to develop the, the leaders of our future um, or to enhance the training and education that the, the woman already has. So that's what Junior League is. And we've been in this town, particularly for over 95 years. This is our 95th anniversary this year. COVID kind of put a damper on our plans, but we're really proud. And we're also part of a bigger organization that I'll get to in a minute. If you want to advance the slide. So the Junior League of Evansville has been existing since 1926 in the Evansville area. We have over 300 plus members. We have around 65 active members, 18 new members, and the rest of them are what we call sustaining members. We have women from all backgrounds and fields and ages. Some of our past projects are the Westman Nature Center, Wright's Home Museum, SEMO, and Little Lands. And we are really proud to be able to recognize that we work with you on our bike ride initiative. Um, the Junior League is basically a, a larger entity internationally. So we have, we're a member of the Association of Junior League Internationals. That means that there's 292 leagues in four different countries across the world. And there's over 155,000 women. So we're very similar to being uh, like you are as Rotary members, a larger entity. I loved it when I was doing the bike ride. I took a trip to Florida and there was Rotary signs everywhere, things they were doing in parks and whatnot. So I always had that strong connection. And again, we're from women of all different backgrounds and fields. So a couple of things about food insecurity that not only Junior League is aware of, but Feed Evansville. Um, first of all, in the state of Indiana, uh, we have over um, 800,000 people are struggling with hunger. Over 200,000 are children in just in Indiana. And 49.1% of households receive net, uh, SNAP benefits and those families have children. Our Vanderburg County, the, this was 2019 data, was tw uh, 27,200 people that are food insecure. And then I'm gonna talk about what food insecure means. We often talk about hunger, but food insecure is actually very different and something that we should actually hone in on because it's more of a daily situation that happens. 53% of the children of the, our school system here in Evansville are on free reduced lunch, which is an indicator of food insecurity within the home. 90% of the children that live in the Promise Zone are on the free reduced lunch program. <clears throat> so what has Junior League done with this initiative? So Junior League is, um, decided a couple years ago to focus on the Promise Zone children. Um, we started off with doing a SNAP program in conjunction with the Healthy Community Partners and Urban Seeds and the Wellborn Foundation. So every Saturday we'd go to the Franken Sh Street uh, Bazaar and we would set up a booth and we would take SNAP. So that means um, people who are on the SNAP program, which is um, the new word for food stamps, would come to the farmer's market, they would run their SNAP card, um, and then we would give them vouchers for that amount of money where they could go and purchase fresh produce at a more reduced rate than what you would get at a grocery store. Um, and they're fresher because it's coming right from the farm. Then the farmer would come up to the junior league booth and they would hand us those vouchers and we'd hand them cash. And then the U.S. government would put the cash back in our account through the SNAP program. Um, with that, in just one year, we did over $504 in SNAP. And then we were really um, excited. The Healthy Community Partners partnered with St. Vincent's, and we were able to do 539 double bucks. So for every dollar up to $10 that someone got for SNAP, we could give them another dollar. So we could double their, their food expansion. And we're really excited because Junior League then helped with a $260 uh, power in produce. The kids would come to the table of the families, and when they play food games with us, we would have, we call it tasty, try it and taste it. So we introduce them to like pomegranates or squashes and things that they wouldn't normally probably have. And they and we would give them a produce buck that they could go and spend at the farmer's market. Now, some children would save them throughout the season and buy a bunch of things at the end. Someone wanted a watermelon. I had a little girl that's like, I'm going to buy a watermelon. And so she would save her dollar and someone would go right and buy an apple or get a thing of strawberries or blueberries and things. So it was helping to promote them to be conscious of food in a positive way. So we're really excited about that. So what else have we done? So at our school break lunch program, why are we doing it? Um, we, we started off really to, for goodwill. We really, genuinely really believe in not just being 
in the community, but being with the community. So when we decided Promise Zone was our area, we moved all our meetings to the Promise Zone area. We wanted to introduce ourselves and, and walk alongside the community. So we started doing our free lunch program just to say hello. And as we were doing it, we found that the need was necessity. Um, parents were coming up thanking us for this. And we also found the need that the backpack program wasn't covering the entire sector that we had hoped. So the backpack program is an initiative from the Tri-State Food Bank and the school system where a child will go home on Friday with a kit that has certain pop top food for them to eat. And um, <clears throat> the Backpack Home is a wonderful program. We think it should continue, but we knew that there were some gaps with it and generally wanted to fill those gaps. So our stats with the free lunch program is it, it costs us $1.50 per lunch. It started off $3 and generally worked with food distributors locally to get that cost down to $1.50. Within that lunch, the child receives a turkey roll-up. Um, they receive a juice box, a bag of carrots, a bag of pretzels, an apple or a banana, which is ever in season or on sale, and then a fun snack. So we try to make it a nutritional lunch that they'll still enjoy. Um, we prepared um, just in the last couple of months over 6,850 lunches. Um, we served over 5,850 lunches and we donated 1,000 to certain organizations that needed lunches during the shutdown. Um, what we found out within doing this lunch program is neighborhoods were welcoming and opening and they wanted to talk about finding the solutions. Um, service needed to be mobile and in the community. So often we have a great idea and we set up shop somewhere and we want everybody to come to us. This initiative works better when we can go to them and we can go out in the neighborhood. So junior league literally will get all in our minivans, put magnets on the side of our minivans, pull up and start knocking on doors and asking people if they would like lunches for their children. And we, and what we're wanting to do is what I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, parents aren't always able to make it to farmer markets due to transportation and timing. In fact, they're not always able to make it up to the school when the school is offering free lunches. So um, the food security situation that everyone doesn't always understand is that there's four stages of food insecurity. And if you suffer from one stage, you are defined as food insecure. So food insecurity starts with um, availability of food. Is there enough food in your area that you can have or you have exposure to? Farmers markets, grocery stores, all kinds of different pantries, all of those are available. Restaurants, that is all availability of food. Now, sometimes you go in a rural area, there's not a grocery store for maybe an hour. So you don't have availability of food, okay? Then I will tell you, Evansville has food in abundance. Food is not the issue. Not having enough food is not the issue in Evansville. Then you have access. Can you get to the food that's available to you? So for instance, if you go look at Haney's Corner, can anyone walk to a grocery store if they live in Haney's Corner? Yes. Can they? Is there one right there on that corner? That's actually a convenience store, and they charge you like five dollars for a gallon of milk. So you're referring? Are you referring to a grocery store? I'm, I'm referring to like a Schnucks oh, or an Aldi's, no, no, no. right? There you go. The so the answer would be no. So they don't have walking access. So that means they don't have access to food unless they have a vehicle to drive, right? So, and then you have people that don't have a vehicles or they're shut in. So actually through my, through my work, I'm finding out that access is the issue in Evansville. People can't get to the food that we need. For instance, we have 85 pantries in the entire tri-state Evansville area and none of them are at capacity. But I'm delivering and handing out 3,000 to 7,000 food boxes a week doesn't line up, right? But none of the programs go out into the communities to help. You have to get to them. And we're finding, I do about 100 to 200 deliveries a week. And the, and the reason why it's only that little is because I'm a one woman shop. <laughs> so um, we, we could do more. So we're finding out that access is a huge issue. So um, the other part of it is use and utilization. Do you know how to use the food that you is provided to you or that you have access to? So if, if I hand you a big pound 
a corn mill, do you know what to do with it? I, I mean, some of the food boxes that we get, I don't know what to do with it. Like they give out bags of beans and, and a lot of people are like, great, that's fantastic. I personally, as a 43 year old woman, I don't know what to do with a bag of beans. I've never soaked beans. I've never made beans. You can show me later. <laughs> I see your wheels turning going, how do you not know to do beans? But <laughs> no, what true. you're saying, it's just really surprising me. Mm-hmm. Because wouldn't schnooks or bio or whatever help you out with these lunches? Are these meal plans? Well, yeah, we, we do. We get help with them in, and, and I'll go over our partners and things in a minute. But I'm talking about the person who's receiving things. If they open the box and they can only utilize half the box. And, okay. and for instance, even with the Farm to Family Initiative that the USDA made these boxes, they're beautiful produce boxes. They're fresh right off the farm, you know, carrots, apples, potatoes. But one week during the summer, they put a pomegranate in there. I think they just had pomegranates. I got calls, not, what is this? It was all over Facebook. These people were opening these boxes going, what is this? What is this? So it's understanding that. So, right. so yeah. Right. So we have, we have a utilization issue as well. Another part of utilization is also, can your body, is your body healthy enough to take the food that you're receiving and break it down to the nutritional value that your body needs. So a lot of people that are already food insecure have have medical issues and their body, and they don't have the funds or the means to have the proper diet to keep up their nutritional health. Um, And then then are you stable? That means, do I know where my next meal is coming from at all times? So you might eat today, but do you know what you're eating tomorrow? Do you know what you're eating next week? Often within families, and I have experienced this myself, if your car breaks down, you're eating pancakes for the entire week because that's what you can afford at that point. So you're not sure really what's going to happen with your meals. And your food is always the first place that families cut in budget. So you're you're, you're all saying, so you're you're talking about, yeah, from we might have abundance, but it's always about the quality of the food. Correct. So yeah, food deserts are interesting. How many food establishments exist in food deserts? Exactly. But it's not the quality. Right. So fast foods are abundance in food deserts, but in grocery stores and quality of food are not. So your use and utilization goes like this. And um, so I always, I'm on this big kick of helping everybody understand, are you donating food that's almost about to expire? So people who need food security need long shelf life longevity, right? And we're giving them food that we go into our cupboards and go, oh, okay. Or we stop by Schnucks or Walmart and we buy the end cap of the macaroni and cheese because it's like 50 cents a box. But is that what we're going to just feed our family constantly? So we have to start looking at food security more as an essential part of life. Every human being in the entire world has to eat. So it's it's far more than just an issue. It's about the people. So we can keep going. <clears throat> so what we, what uh, Junior League is doing is Junior League is also taking all this data that I've been kind of piling on top of the Junior League method from Feed Evansville, and we've come up with a three-year plan. So year one, which we've already started doing, but this is our full year, is we're going to purchase a food truck. Not a food truck, as you might know it, where we can make the food on the truck and we sell it and things like that. It's going to be a truck that has refrigeration, storage, things of that nature. We're going to make lunches elsewhere in a commercial grade kitchen, load up the truck, and we're going to take a mobile vehicle that is wrapped and it's a little bit more friendly than women showing up in their minivans, jumping out of the car, you know, because of not the best look. And have a schedule so the children know, like an ice cream truck, when is the truck coming to my neighborhood? And handing out the lunches. In year two, we're going to hand out lunches and we're going to introduce a mobile pantry sliding scale produce purchasing plan. So that means children or or the families can come up to the truck and we'll have a list of items donated and purchased. And they can pick so many donated items like canned goods, box goods, things that are non-perishable. But then they can purchase corn, apples, potatoes, cheese, eggs, milk at a reduced rate. So a sliding scale. So that to me is what I would call recovery work. 
So when you can purchase groceries at a sliding scale and you're getting, it's not just relief when you're just being handed something. So we want to have a mixture of relief and recovery on the truck at all times. And then year three, we'll hand out lunches, we'll do the mobile uh, pantry sliding scale purchase, and then we're going to do educational activities. So we'll be going out to the parks and the pools and playing food games and things with the children to help break the cycle of food insecurity and malnutrition. So we've already kind of went over the why, lack of resources when school's not in session. Um, backpacks are not fulfilling the needs and some areas have no programs and some areas have no access. Um, the cost of our program is going to be $150,000 just to purchase the truck. Then we feel that it's important for this to, uh, to be stable, that we have a part-time employee that is in charge of driving the truck. So that way, not every junior league member has to <laughs> learn how to drive the truck, be insured, and all those kind of things. Um, then, we'll, of course, we'll have the cost of food, the cost of promotion. Um, and then we got a quote about $500 a year for the truck. We already have a liability insurance that will cover the volunteers and things of those nature. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about a large trailer, you know those big, nice looking box trailers that have mm -hmm. side doors, they have back doors, they have where they let down so you can drive things in, so you can have them made the way you want them, mm -hmm. and they're $7,000, and you can pull them with a pickup truck, and, right. and you can, they've got units on them so that you've got electric lights, their own power propane to, to run a, uh, a refrigeration unit like you would have in a camper. And uh, a whole lot less. Well, it, it would be the the issue would be then who would pull the truck, like who would be the truck that was always constant to pull the trailer. The trailer. So like, because so. Well, we've got to have this, who's going to pull the drive the truck? Well, we're going to have a part time employee. That's the part time employee. That's the part time employee will drive the truck, but we it's kind of like would we can't ask someone we would have to purchase a truck then. Do you well, see? We see pickup truck. truck. A, a good 250 Ford pickup truck you might get for twenty five or thirty thousand dollars, and you got seven or eight or ten thousand in the trailer put the way you want it. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying you might be able to do it for thirty or forty thousand dollars instead of one hundred fifty thousand in in a uh, almost like a recreational vehicle. Wait, is that what you're looking at? I, it sounds like you're not looking at a truck truck. You're looking, we're looking at, at something. we're looking at a food truck. Yeah, so it's, truck, it has so. it has so. So, so for instance, the health department's working with us, we have to have a sink with working water. We have to have a grease trap, even though we're not cooking, we're still by guidelines and, and regulations, the health department well, says we have to saying, if grease you just trap. had a truck, you bought a truck mm -hmm. and you bought a trailer separate. Mm -hmm. And then they hook the trailer up to the truck and pull it mm -hmm. rather than have a great big like 45 foot motor home that's been converted into mm -hmm. a food truck, food thing. Mm -hmm. especially built. I'm just saying it might be an option that, that uh, I don't know if they have the department that they would work with that. That's I mean, we'll we'll look into it because I know there are trailers at the at the Franklin Street Bazaar. I just, we we actually looked into like refurbishing of like older vehicles, and it was going to cost us with all the things that they told us we had to have. It was going to cost us more money to refurbish a vehicle than just to buy a food truck brand new, customized to our specs with Wi-Fi and all this other stuff. But we'll definitely I'll put it on the table and, and have them. I mean, it's just it. an option where the the motor and the pulling vehicle mm -hmm. is separate from the sure. from the so. the part that is uh, mm -hmm. the kitchen and the mm -hmm. and the other stuff but, yeah yeah i mean i mean who delivers when you deliver all this food you're paying for your fuel you're paying for the wearing and tear on your vehicle and doing it as a volunteer yeah i'm i'm a volunteer i volunteer for about 60 hours a week so all of that time is not considered in the cost of this program well this is junior league um, feed evansville is completely separate so junior league they're a volunteer organization right so we we put volunteer cost at the federal level of 27 dollars an hour and so this is just the the tactical price that we would need and we and we're looking for volunteers and things and then when we do when we actually end the program or as we monitor it, we'll put the, hey, we have this many volunteers. Volunteers are valued at this much an hour. Well, it sounds to me like you could 
thousands of dollars in expenses, you could then go and wear out a vehicle in two or three years with all the deliveries you're making and mm -hmm. stuff. And well, this won't be this won't be a daily situation. This will be like on Saturday for two hours. Oh. And then it'll be during the summer, like three days a week for two hours each day. Now, Feed Evansville, I was very fortunate. The mayor found a grant. Um, once he found out I was doing everything out of my minivan, which has taken a toll, um, he he found a grant and the city purchased a, a, a refrigerated 14-foot uh, box truck for Feed Evansville. So mm -hmm. with a ramp. So now I load everything up on the truck and go out into the neighborhoods and, and deliver it. But it sounds like you're going to need a specialized truck. Yeah, that needs to be yeah. pressure fit. Yeah, oh, no, 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 that standpoint, a box truck is fine because mm -hmm. it's doing exactly what a trailer would. And it's just well, but we want to stand they, in the vehicle and yeah. hand meals out and things. Yeah, so we also bigger. have to have, you know, we, we have to have room for people to be on it. And so, but we'll definitely, the trailer situation of what you're talking about, I will put on the table for well, generally to look into it. It's a, a thought, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly how you operate, but it takes to replace all this and pay to have it done mm -hmm. for what you guys are doing mm -hmm. is would be very expensive. I think based upon Dave's uh, suggestion, it is probably possible to get what you want for less than 150. Mm -hmm. You know, chopping around. I think he has a point there. But mm -hmm. the, the, the stuff that you do and yeah. going out of community right. is um, that adds up and the, all those people, that's wonderful. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But we would do you get farm boy to get involved with you regarding feed Evansville or yeah. junior league? So, not really. Uh, CRS from Owensboro has been our food distributor and they give us everything at cost. Our Wabash food distributors have been since you... no, we've been we've been... Anybody sent a letter to any of these people. No, we, we haven't had the need. CRS has filled every single need we've had. So, I mean, so we we just so haven't needed to reach out to anybody else. So we need yeah. peanut butter. CRS helps us find peanut butter. I mean, we haven't had a problem. I've been a um, part of what Evans Feed Evansville is also doing is organizations will um, call us and say, like Potter's will call me and she's like, I can't get jelly anywhere. So she continues doing what she needs to do for the day, and I get on the phone and I find cases of jelly. And so uh, CRS actually, uh, Alan Clark, who runs it, is he's like a little angel in the food business, and he gets he just helps me with everything. So I haven't needed to. So now they donate that to you? No. Um, they give it to as cost, mm -hmm. and there has been donations made throughout the year, um, and they help us. Like he'll he'll park a semi, and just leave it at Harky Pool for me. And he helps me with vehicles and guys and, and things like that. So for instance, Lay's potato trip, chip truck during the holidays had a, a bad accident by the highway. And they we had 43,000 pounds of potatoes sitting in a semi and the insurance company called me and said, we, we don't wanna throw these out, what should we do? So uh, the CRS took the semi out to the site and gave me a bunch of their employees, and they we sat there and shoveled potatoes from one truck to the other. <laughs> wow! And we yeah. handed out forty three thousand pounds of potatoes wow. <laughs> that week. So um, it was it was feast or famine. <laughs> so, but um, Junior League has done a lot of research about about the trucks and, and things like that. But I will talk to them about <laughs> looking at the trailer possibilities and things, um, and seeing what we if that's a different angle to go. So if you want to click. Oh, there we go. So you're probably like, well, how can we help? Well, so we're going to host the lunch truck for three to five years. And um, we are looking for someone to fiscally hold the truck. It's not Junior League's model to own the truck. Um, it's more of our model to have somebody say, we'll own the truck and Junior League kind of pays for it. And we're involved in the program and provide the volunteers and the funds and resources and things. So we are talking to the YMCA and St. Vincent's de Paul to physically be the fiscal holders of the truck and the employee. Um, we're looking for people to be full-time partners with the program, but also part-time program uh, partners with the program. The program will be fully funded through nine other organizations um, and or federal funding. 
and volunteers will be provided. So Junior League has already raised um, over $75,000 for the project. And we have grants that are supplying all the money for the food and resources. Um, we just need to finish the $75,000 for the truck that we're looking for. Um, but we're also looking for organizations to adopt a day. So we would like to be able to have this truck operational three times a week during the summer, um, every Saturday during the year. And then when school's not in session, twice during spring break, twice during winter break, twice during fall break. So that way it keeps going. Um, so we're looking for organizations to say, hey, we'll take the first Saturday of every month, or hey, we'll take the the, the last Saturday, or we'll take the Monday during the summer, or we'll just do these odd days. That way, we're all kind of working together to have the volunteer hours and not putting it all on Junior League and Evansville Oasis, who's a, one of our partners. So those are different ways that we can have organizations help. So some things we're in the process of doing, we already have a location to make lunches. We are looking for an employee to drive the truck once the truck is purchased. Uh, we already have volunteers to make lunches and pass out lunches or doing program, but we can always use more. I always tell everybody a lot of hands equal light work. We already have marketing set up. Um, we are in the process of looking for a space to store food. So we have an office is all generally has. So we're looking for a location where we can actually buy food. Right now they're using Feed Evansville's Harky Pool and Cooler. We don't really need a cooler for this, but we need a place where we can store non-perishables and things like that. Um, we're, we have sponsors and ongoing donations, always can use more. And we um, or have someone who's doing all our great writing for us, but are always open for assistance with all those things. How, how big a space do you need? A closet. Like we'll make it work, but we really just need a closet space. Nothing. Closet space is space to store food. Well, because we're non-perishable. We're, non-perishable. We're talking like cans and little boxes of mac macaroni and cheese and things. Nothing too I crazy. You were looking for like fifteen thousand square feet. No, we just need a closet, just to kind of like to to store like the paper bags and the lunch bags. Like nothing crazy. But we, we have a small office space that's probably less about the size of that little cove back there. And so if we would put all that in there, our office manager would be like, you're killing me. <laughs> so we're just trying to find a closet yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah to, to store some items that are non-perishable. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so um, some of our partners currently are um, Evansville Oasis with the University of Evansville. They're the change maker students. And they're helping us with the mobile pantry part of it. Healthy Community Partners, both hospitals, St. Vincent's and Deaconess are on board. Urban Seeds, Me Johnson, and USI are our current partners. So any questions or thoughts? Okay, so you're asking this if you have a junior. Okay, can you kind of shed some light on the Feed Evansville's future? Yes. What we talked about so, what it's evolving into separate from this. Yeah, so this is all a uh, junior league with right. free truck program, and they're working very closely with Feed Evansville on the initiative because um, getting information. But Feed Evansville, like I told you, have done all those different projects throughout the years, but throughout this year. But what else Feed Evansville has been doing is we've been doing surveying. So I can tell you that over 60% of people coming to the Harkey pool line every week have never needed food assistance prior to March. And 67% of them have lost their jobs due to COVID and have not returned back to work. So we have a whole new population that is dealing with insecurities of financial need, food needs, things like that. Um, so throughout this process, gathering data and doing these things, um, <clears throat> there was also a recommendation to the mayor's office because in April, the mayor named me uh, the reopening of Evansville's food insecurity chair. So I've been working with the mayor's office and we made the recommendation to be the food commission. We need a food commission. We have a homeless commission in our town, but we need a food insecurity commission. The mayor um, agreed and put forth an uh, ordinance to the city council in January and it was passed. And the food commission will have their first meeting on March 15th. Uh, Feed Evansville, the goal 
as of today, but we all know this past year things change all the time, is that we will probably stop feeding food, physically handing out food on June 1st, and we'll fold into the commission. And the commission's first line of business is to really focus on uh, recovery programs. So we have tons of relief programs. Here's food, here's food, here's food right in Evansville, but we don't have any re a lot of relief work. We have one nourish and they they basically help do bulk buying. Um, they don't feed about 100 families. So we need to increase that. So we're going to be helping organizations pivot programs and look at relief work or create relief work and look at delivery systems that are at low cost or no cost. Um, and that's kind of the first line. So feed Evansville will be Kind of folding into this long-term food security thought and strategic plan of the city for food security in the commission thank you for everything you do um, yes. a lot of people don't understand oh, thank you. i did it for 17 years yeah and i bet anybody and anybody i could there's no child that ever went yeah without a meal whether they have money or not well, when I talk to people prior to COVID about food insecurity, they're like, we don't have food insecurity in Evansville. No one's hungry. And I'm like, yes, sure. they are. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they and are. then the, the pandemic really just put a spotlight on it. And, you know, we're going to have ripple effects from the shutdown for years to come. And, you know, when people were in the very beginning, I had a, a lady that was of an elderly age. I found her in her trailer and she was eating peanut butter and crackers for two weeks. And because she was scared to go out. But then I'm finding out people that I take food to all the time. I, I, I just ask very pointed questions like, what were you doing before March? I've only been around since March. So who was bringing you food? And they're like, well, sometimes I would just stretch it out as long as I could until someone from church would drop something off or I could get to something. Because if you don't have availability to go, you know, I have a, a young lady. She's you not must have statistics, at least here in Evansville. Yeah, that's what, that's what you're collecting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So where the hot spots are that people ignore are over in Grandin Point on the north side. So 51% of the kids at Highland Elementary are in free and reduced lunch. Per capita, that's more than Glenwood and Lincoln combined. Oh, wow. But and no one knows that. And everyone's like, well, it's the north side. And I'm like, wow. It's so what's your point? My grandson goes to that school. Right, but there's a whole population that feeds into that school that are on this Alice population, and everyone ignores the Alice population. It's the working class poverty. We're ranked number six in the state of Indiana for working class poverty. Wow. But it, you know, so the promise zone is fantastic, and that's really where Junior League is focusing at with this free lunch program, but we bleed into over in the Highland School District. And there's like only one, maybe two pantries in the entire north side. So if you go to Food Finder and you type in my zip code, which is 47725, which is a huge yeah. zip code on the north side, there's no food pantries. See? No, because they label. It's right. It's like, and same with Newburgh gets that stigma, all these things. But, you know, we have to start breaking down these red lines and understand that people are people. And I mean, there's foreclosures happening all over the north side because of the shutdown. Well, what are those people doing? And um, we have a lady that's um, in her 70s. She walks to the grocery store with a little cart, walks home, takes a nap, walks back, comes home, takes a nap, goes again until I started bringing her groceries. So we have like this gamut and we had um, a mother when we were doing our free lunch program um, and I'm almost done. She wasn't eating so her kids could eat and they were so excited that they could all get their own meal. But they were still eating. You see what I'm saying? There was still yeah. food in the house, but they have to make it stretch. So really what's happening is people were eating before, but they weren't eating a quality or three meals a day or things of that nature. And that's still food insecurity. But it's, you hit on it when you said transportation, mm -hmm. because when I helped with the tri-state automation, we didn't have single moms that had to get up in the morning because their car had been broken down for a long time. Mm -hmm. Get up in the morning, get on, get a child ready, get on a bus, take the child to child care, ride a bus back to the house, get themselves ready, ride a bus to work. And then reverse that in the evenings, and that had nothing to do with going to the grocery store. Thank you. Right. And so transportation and being doing the things you were talking about into these areas is so darn important. 
have to use that part of the equipment that they don't have access to. Right. It's, I, I applaud you for picking all that up. We need to actually do that. Well, and when we all can work together, we'll be able to expand and do more. And, and not that we'll ever eradicate hunger, you know what I mean? But we definitely can take our numbers down from 20% of food insecurity prior to the pandemic that was 14. We can take it down to 10. We can get it down to 5%. And we can help these people come to a more recovery state or stable state instead of just living in a relief state. So and those are our goals. Is, is the ready made snacks, and that's the meal, and it, it is not going to help them grow and, and mature and have healthy brains and right. be able to take care of themselves someday. Yeah, food insecurity with children affect all kinds of things. So, okay, well, I'll let you guys thank go you. for thank the you. day. So, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, thank you. All right, well. Appreciate everybody being here today. And I think we'll just wrap it up with that since we're running over time here. Okay. See y'all next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry it was late, everybody. No, no, no. Yeah.